Hey everyone, welcome to Sunday School again, one book, one story, and this week we are continuing through the Old Testament, and we'll be looking at the book of Joel. But since it's a uh, kind of a special time in the in this calendar year, this liturgical year, we're also going to be adding in a couple of New Testament elements because this Sunday is Ascension Sunday, and then pretty soon it will be Pentecost, and so. Um, the book we're studying here in Joel actually has an interesting connection to that time period. So I wanted to lift that up. Um, if you have been joining us along the way, you know that what we've been doing is just going book by book. And um, this week is uh, the next one that's up. And so if you are um, someone who would like to look at other weeks, uh, we've been moving through this time of quarantine, uh, just book by book as we've gone. So there are plenty of other ones for you to look at if you so choose. Uh, but the book of Joel is a short one. It's three chapters. And in it, we have uh, another opportunity, I guess you could say, or another moment where we see the people of Israel in lament. Um, this book, though, is, is interesting because it's not tied to any particular time period. I think what you've seen since we've been doing this is uh, I try to make sure you have a very particular context in mind whenever we're looking at these books. Um, some of them are uh, sort of early in that prophetic stage of the Old Testament, uh, basically that goes from around 800 years before Jesus to uh, maybe a few hundred years before Jesus. And this one can sort of be taken in a number of those. Uh, historians don't have a specific uh, time period that they can pin Joel to, uh, because again, we don't have originals of these writings, and Joel doesn't really um, pinpoint something in the writing that would point to a particular period. Um, Joel and his life is a little bit of a mystery. Uh, there's not a whole lot of detail or background or other places where you see his writings or references to him outside of Scripture, so it's a little hard to pin down. So as you read the book of Joel, you don't need to think about one particular context. It's okay to think about just um, difficult times in general, because what Joel is looking at is a time of famine, a time when the world was really harsh and hard, and uh, the people were struggling, and um, Joel felt like they needed to repent um, so they would have favor with God. And so the two places I'm going to have us look in Joel um, are just, just kind of reference that. And then I'll be um, taking us over to the New Testament for just a little bit as kind of a cross-reference, because uh, again, I want to connect this to you um, to our current context, which is thinking about the Ascension and thinking about Pentecost. So let's start um, in the first chapter of Joel. Um, Joel starts by talking about the devastation of the land um, and the starvation and drought that has come because of that devastation. Uh, there have been a plague of insects uh, that have um, just done horrible things to crops and to the availability of food, and Joel is calling on everyone to be a part of this lament and be a part of this, um, the recovery, which he hopes comes through prayer and repentance. So we're actually going to start in uh, chapter 1 and start in verse 13, just to give you a glimpse into what Joel is calling the people into. <coughs> So let's start here in 13. Gird yourselves with sackcloth, and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, proclaim solemn assembly, Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, 
and will come as destruction from the Almighty. He has not food, has not food been cut off before our eyes, gladness and joy from the house of our God. The seeds shrivel under their clods, and the storehouses are desolate. The barns are torn down, for the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle wander aimlessly, because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I cry, for the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame has been burned up all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, for the water brooks as dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So clearly a very bleak time. And there isn't any reason why we couldn't try to apply uh, this sort of lament to um, other times where we feel uh, that things are desolate and things are, are going horribly wrong. And my gut says that this is a lot of the ways that this book was used. Uh, this is meant for us to add words and language and some um, faithfulness to uh, times of hardship. And... Joel is taking a, a lot of time in his writing to point all of that out. That there are um, economic uh, ramifications of all of the, uh, the issues at hand in that day, whatever day that was, um, but they bleed over into our faith and they bleed, o bleed into the way that we um, see God and we see ourselves. Um, that those two things um, are... Um, linked together and um, that each one affects the other. So this is um, Joel being very intentional and in being able to name how he feels and how he feels like the nation feels. And I think that that's something that's important for us to be able to do. You and I tend to be those who just sort of gloss over the things that uh, harm us. We don't want to uh, burden anybody else with naming them or by talking about them. Uh, far too often we stuff them away or we ignore them. And I think that what this book does is uh, take the time and um, with courage go about having, um, having a moment where Israel can lament together and can name the things that are, are, are hurtful. And, um, and so I think that's a good lesson for us, especially right now. Uh, as we think about um, moving throughout this time of pandemic and uh, hopefully looking somewhere uh, in the future to something that feels more hopeful, um, to be able to not bypass what has been um, hard about this experience, but to be able to talk about it, to be able to say it, and hopefully to find other people who are willing to commiserate with us. I think that's that, that's a big part of this experience, and I, I hope it's one that we um, recognize and also uh, do all that we can to share with other people. Uh, so that's the first lesson that I see here in, in Joel. So we move uh, forward into um, Joel continuing to kind of sit with the, the darkness and what's hard about this time. Um, he sees uh, God moving in really dramatic um, kind of heavenly ways. Uh, it talks about the day of the Lord uh, coming, that there's going to be a, a kind of a retribution um, for the actions of Israel, and uh, that we're seeing some of the, the first part of it um, here in this moment. So uh, that kind of continues on for a little bit into chapter 2. And then um, as we get closer to the end of chapter 2, uh, it starts to turn a little bit, as we see happen often in these uh, prophetic books. At some point, uh, the, the prophet will add some sort of hope to it. Um, they'll bring to light um, how they see God acting positively for humanity. And I'm going to point out one uh, portion of this that uh, gets echoed later, which is why I'm pointing to it. And I thought this book was such an interesting thing to be looking at, especially right now. 
Uh, we're going to move to chapter 2, and we're going to go to um, verse 28. And the, the subtext, subtitle here in, in my version of Scripture says, The Promise of the Spirit. Um, so that should obviously be important to us as we think about this time of Ascension and Pentecost. So what I'll have you do is just put your thumb in chapter 2 of Joel, uh, and then fast forward a little bit um, to the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is something that we're in often at this time because it, it uh, within it is the Pentecost and, and also Christ's Ascension. And this week you'll be seeing um, you'll be seeing scripture from chapter one of Acts that describes the ascension, and then chapter two that describes uh, Pentecost. So uh, if you move forward to um, Acts chapter two, um, you have all of that portion of uh, the first part of um, Pentecost in chapter two, and the first half of of that chapter that describes the events of Pentecost. And then after that, uh, Peter starts to speak. He starts a sermon in response to what had just happened. So we're going to go back and forth a little bit, but I just want to show you where Joel is quoted uh, and how Peter uses this quote um, as he's um, sort of pointing at what the current times look like for the people uh, who are there for this Pentecost time. So, um, in ch going backwards into chapter 2 of Joel, um, we see this quote, and it comes um, with a, after a promise that Israel, um, that will be delivered. So, um, if we start in chapter 2 of Joel in verse 28, uh, going to 32, it says this, I will come after this that I will pour out my spirit on all hu humanity. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And so a promise that all of this will come to an end, that God will save them, and that um, there is a, a kind of promise of God's Spirit moving among the people once again. So we take that quote in response to um, a lack of food, uh, a lack of harvest, um, where everything it seems lost and the people are starving, and we go to this time of Pentecost. And Pentecost uh, is not a Christian invention. It was a, a festival and a, a sacred day that was already being celebrated by the people of Israel before um, Acts chapter 2, where it describes the wind and the fire, um, it was a celebration of harvest. It was a celebration of the time of God uh, providing for the people. And so the fact that Joel, um, in response to, self, uh, to starvation, um, is pleading with God and is promising this time where the people will um, be filled with the Spirit again, we see very similar language in this time of Pentecost, the time of harvest. So if we look at Peter's sermon, he goes right into responding to the people uh, with, with these, the same words that we see in Joel. So we start in verse four, 14. <coughs> Excuse me. This is uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raising his voice and declared to them, Men of Judah, or Judea, and all those who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, those who were speaking in all these different tongues, um, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. 
But this is what has spoken through the prophet Joel. And he goes on to, to repeat the same words that we heard in Joel. It shall be known in the last days, God says, that I will pull, pour forth of my spirit over all humanity. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Um, that same language is used to describe um, how God would, would show up and be redeemed and that uh, we would uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit and that that would move us forward into a time of promise and in a, a time of plenty. So this, this is something I wanted to point out just because as we're looking at Joel, we see all those kind of really heavy language and sometimes that can be hard for us to, to get our minds around and to kind of drudge through. But you can see that those words are used for a really good purpose, um, not just in Joel, but moving forward into this sermon from Peter um, in this really important time, obviously, in the early church where it's moving from Jesus being with the people and now Jesus not being physically with them but they would have to carry on through the strength and the advocacy of the Spirit, uh, moving the church forward, uh, expanding who could be a part of it, um, redefining what that kind of uh, gathering and what faith and religion meant. All of that is sort of swept up in this. And uh, Peter quotes it here um, as a really nice bridge to uh, from our message of Joel uh, for today and what we're seeing in the lectionary currently in our calendar. And so to point all of this to our current week of the Ascension, um, what I thought I, I have seen um, as I've been doing work for this Sunday, and uh, I was looking at the, the, the passage for uh, our preacher for this morning, who is K. Day, uh, Kay is our uh, one of the missionaries that we um, that we support, and she was good enough to send us from a very long distance a sermon for this month, and we thought this was a, a good time to have that sermon be presented. And so you're going to be hearing from Kay Day today, um, and in it, in this sermon, she talks a lot about endurance. And all of these passages, to me, speak a lot to that idea. Um, Joel calling for the people to repent and to persevere and to rely on God and to know that that deliverance and that spirit is coming. And then the same happens in this time of Ascension and Pentecost, that, um, you know, this is, this is going to be the pivotal time that you need to be the church, that you need to be uh, persevering and have that endurance because Christ is not going to be in the flesh with you. Um, and as I was looking at this, um, at, you know, looking forward to Pentecost, uh, looking at uh, our, this current Sunday of the Ascension, I um, was asking a colleague of mine, um, who I happen to know it has a particular affinity for the theology surrounding the Ascension. And I wanted to um, share that with you because it speaks a lot to, I think, the themes that we see in this passage uh, about endurance and about how important this pivot is. That um, Jesus is getting us ready um, from really the time of resurrection, is getting us ready for this time where we'll be pivoting away from having him physically here with us to being led by Christ's Spirit and needing to have the kind of um, strength to do that. And I wanted to share with you whenever I asked her, could, could you give me a way of understanding the ascension, which um, kind of speaks to its essence. And um, this is from my, uh, my friend, uh, Reverend Laura Strauss, who is the pastor at Sunset Hills in Mount Lebanon. Um, her services and her information you could find online uh, or on Facebook or other things like that. Uh, she's more than worth your time in terms of um, her sermons and her worship service for Sunset Hills, uh, but also uh, for some of the, the devotional things that she's been doing online. So 
I recommend to you uh, Laura Strauss if that's uh, another sort of resource for you, especially in this time when we can have the privilege of going back and forth and seeing lots of different worship services. So I asked Laura about the Ascension, and this is what she said. The Ascension is part of the completing work of salvation begun on the cross, celebrated in the resurrection, and completed in Christ's return. There is no rejoicing in his return without the acknowledgement and realization of the rising into heaven. Additionally, it is not the work of the resurrection that is significant to the Lord, but the news that it is to be shared with the disciples that he is ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. The news of the imminent ascending of Christ is of such importance that this is the news that Jesus shares with Mary Magdalene soon after being resurrected. He doesn't talk to her about the resurrection. He tell her, tells her to go and share that Jesus is about to ascend. Now, I looked up exactly where that was, and it's in John chapter 20, and I'm going to as quickly as possible, possible go back to it. Um, so Jesus is has just resurrected. Jesus is uh, has been found by Mary Magdalene, and um, this is his response to Mary clinging to him, and Jesus is trying to give her an important message about what is happening and what is about to happen and what she needs to know and what the disciples need to know. And he says... Um, here we are. So, uh, I'll start in verse 15, but this goes through uh, 18. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. I have to be honest. I didn't really think about that before she said it. I have read that passage many, many times, but I never thought about the fact that Christ's essential lesson to the disciples after resurrecting isn't how amazing is it that I just resurrected, it's how amazing is it that I'm about to go to the Father. That the ascension is the essential kind of message that the church needs to, to be thinking about because they have already endured so much and now that Christ has returned his message to them is going to be about preparing them to be without him and that that means relying on God's spirit so the connection here to all of this for me is Joel is responding to an incredibly harsh time, right? He is um, asking for repentance, he's asking for prayer, and he's promising that God will restore us through the working of God's Spirit. We see that Spirit show up now in our current um, place in the calendar, in the Ascension and in Pentecost. In Pentecost that I read a few minutes ago, Joel is quoted directly. And in this, um, all of this, in, in the midst of all of this, is the, um, the call for all of us to endure through the strength of the Spirit. Joel asked for it, Peter asked for it, and Christ asked for it as soon as he is resurrected. That is why the ascension is important. Uh, because it's a time that we prepare ourselves to be the church that we still are right now, which is the church that endures, 
that responds to hardship, that points other people towards Christ, and relies on the Spirit working and moving among us to be those that others can rely on. That's how my brain bridges the gap to all of those things. Joel to the uh, to Pentecost and Ascension, all of that wraps up into responding to hardship through reliance on the Spirit and allowing that to give us endurance and strength. That's how all of that meshes together. So I hope that that, that summation gives you some way of sort of bouncing back and forth between those two things. I realize that was a lot. But um, as I was thinking about this week, I was thinking about the topic of the sermon, um, the, the um, prophet that we will be studying, and then our current time, I just saw this little web being woven together. So I hope that I made that as clear as I could. Um, again, Joel is a pretty short book. Uh, it's something you can read from beginning to end in one sitting. Um, I would encourage you to read it with the first uh, two chapters of the book of Acts, just as a way of sort of bringing it forward to the current time, and see how it reads to you, especially given the hardship of what we're going through right now uh, and the endurance that we need to continue to work through it. I want to thank all of you for uh, joining me today for this Sunday School class. Um, I will be praying for us in a moment, but uh, please know that we continue at Northmont and as a staff and as leadership to be thinking about you and praying for you. And we hope that as we move forward and, and uh, we face the challenges and the changes that are coming, that, um, that not only do you share with us what you need, um, but that you can help us along the way to uh, continue to remind the world that we are very much open and that uh, the mission and ministry of our church continues and that as, um, as things unfold during this pandemic time and um, we see um, what is possible sort of moving and changing, uh, we'll try to keep you up to date on those things. So. Again, thank you for joining me. Let me pray for us, uh, and then we'll conclude. Holy God, through very difficult times, we know that you um, give us what we need to be prepared. Um, that doesn't mean that it's easy, and it doesn't mean that we're not going to stumble along the way. But you have shown us through the uh, enduring advocacy of your Spirit what is possible. Uh, and we thank you for your continued presence with us. Um, I pray that this book and that your word uh, might be revealed to us and that we might see you, ourselves, and our response to you just a little bit more differently than we did before. Um, be with all of us, keep us safe, and uh, we thank you for all that you do to love us and care for us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Again, thank you, everybody. God bless, and I'll see you next time.